Alright, well then we're going to let take over. Um, she is she's a professional that works with um, small businesses and, and, and large businesses, all businesses really. And she does a lot of systemizing. So I'm very interested in hearing what she said. Thank you. She can, um, her profession is scaling, replicating, making sure that you're doing the right things. If you want to grow, you've got systems in place that you can actually do that. So obviously I'm interested because we want to see little black folks scale and grow um, and maybe even franchise. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to her and let her tell you about herself and, um, and how she can help us. Thank you, thank you. So we have one hour left, correct? So one o'clock, is that the game plan? Yes, All right, so I'm going to improvise a little bit because I have a feeling I've got way more content. I've got a couple exercises and involvement activities that I want to okay. do too, so I have to decide what I'm going to do and cut out. But anyway, so here's the thing. Most of the time when people envision a business owner, they think they're super uber wealthy, they're the big dog, they make all the shots, everyone works for them, they're in control. But the reality most of the time is, is it's the exact opposite. They work their butts off, they work a lot of hours, everything else, everybody else gets paid first. Um, they see nothing seems to be able to get done unless they're the ones to do it. And even worse than that, <coughs> excuse me, is that, and you guys have probably heard this statistic before, but like 85% of all businesses that start fail within the first five years, which is absolutely horrible. It's gut wrenching when I just think about all of those people that just put it all out there and then close up shop and lose a lot. Not only time and energy and passion, but a lot of financial um, investment as well. So you want, have to wonder why is it that people dream of and want to start their own business? And, and the reality is, is that first of all, you don't know what you don't know, right? So you're jumping in as an entrepreneur and you don't know that there's an 85% failure, right? You don't know what causes all this failure. You also, um, the other variable is, is that business ownership does provide the wealth. It does provide that personal freedom that people want. The problem is, is that most entrepreneurs are experts at what they do, but they're not experts in business growth. Um, <laughs> why I have a job. <laughs> right, and they don't understand that there's actually a formula for building that kind of a business, and they don't know that they have to follow that formula. Um, so they end up, more often than not, just spinning their wheels, working their butts off, and they finally end up thrown in the towel, usually within that five-year period of time, out of frustration or exhaustion, or they just run out of resources, whether that be energy, passion, time, money, whatever. Um, so that, that um, and, I, and I know that firsthand. Um, my name is Danette, of course, like she said. I am the founder of Trinity Strategic Growth Solutions. Um, I am a co-developer of a program called the Build It to Grow. I am a growthologist, which basically means I am passionate and I love studying the science of business growth. Um, and the thing that I'm most proud of is that I'm a third generation entrepreneur. So my grandparents owned a full retail bakery on Chippewa growing up in the 60s and 70s um, and 80s. My parents had their own bakery in Warson Woods growing up. So I started in the family business at the age of nine. My dad drug me out of bed at 5.30 in the morning. Any of you knew me personally, you would know that I am not a morning person. So you probably scarred me right then and there. I'm like, I'm going to be up till 5, Dad, but I'm never getting up at 5 again. <laughs> uh, so he dragged me into the bakery on Saturdays, and that's when I started my entrepreneurial education, so to speak. Um, and then when I graduated high school, I went to college, I got a degree in business with a focus in marketing and advertising, promotion, and communications, and I went to work for small business owners. And what I saw was they have these same struggles. They all have the same struggles. So after about a decade of running their business development departments and their marketing efforts, I started Trinity, and I started working with companies to help them systematize their marketing. But what I found was that, and this is what we're gonna talk about today, is that so many companies, want they wanna grow, they wanna drive in more business. They wanna drive in more customers but it's actually the exact opposite, and that's what we're gonna talk about today, this system, right? So over the course of the next couple of decades, I really stepped back and I watched. I watched the struggles and the successes of my entrepreneurial family and the others that I worked with, and I really started to break down what worked, what didn't, what's the process, and I built a system around it. And then I thought, you know what, because I'm passionate about entrepreneurs, I love them, I'm mixing my DNA, I said, everybody needs to know this. Then we, they don't have to fail. They just knew this. So I built, I co-developed a program called Build It to Grow. And that's what I want to share with you guys today. It's kind of foundation of what we cover in that program. So I'm going to jump in and go through as much as I can. 
Well, if you guys want a PDF copy of the slides, this is a cell number you can just text LBB to, and you'll get it. And actually, if you've got a, a pad, an iPad, or some sort of a smart device right now, it'll email to you. It'll prompt you to send your email address. And you can open it up, and it's a PDF format, so you can actually type notes in it as we go along. So, you don't you don't mind if I share this in our uh, closed group page? No, that's so absolutely good. I was going to leave this open for about 48 hours. Okay. I was going to leave that open. So let me know when you guys got it. 300-0378. Perfect. Thank you. All right? So we just text L -L -B -B. We don't put our name or anything. It'll prompt you back and ask you for that. Okay. Try to make it simple, simple. So yes, it'll ask you first name, last name, and then email. Just put it in that order of the space in between and then it'll email it to you. All right, so let's jump in and look at what does that ideal business look like? Well, it grows easily. It seems like it's growing effortlessly from the outside, right? Everything just happens. It just continues to grow in value. It also has very few cash flow problems. Sometimes it might have some that are based upon maybe some certain particular situations that are going on, but basically expenses are covered by revenues that are coming in and the company has a reserve of money in place to cover any ebbs and flows. That, are, that might pop up. Things run smoothly, little falls through the cracks, there's not fires constantly that you have to put out. And then the last thing is that it's controllable, which really means that growth it happens because you want it to, you're managing that and you're driving it, it doesn't just happen or not happen. So you've got a system in place, a marketing system in place that you can rev up if you want more business or you can kind of slow it down if you have too much. Now, a lot of times people say to me, well, how in the world can you have too much business? That can't be a problem. But actually, it can be because I see more businesses fail because they grow too fast and they don't have all these things that we're going to, I'm going to try to get through in an hour. I'm no, you're, no, you're right. No, I'm <laughs> they don't have all these things in place. So what they're doing is they're actually digging the grave of the company faster by driving in more business. They're dying faster than if they hadn't driven all that. Another business you need to talk to. Okay, awesome. So here's the brutal truth. This is what, so everybody envisions, I'll go back to that, this is what they envision for their company when they start a business. Everybody does, right? But the reality is, is that 85%, like I mentioned, die, die, d decline, go away within the first five years. 10% survive, so what's survive mean? That just means you're staying afloat, right? You're maybe making a little bit of profit, but you're not on a growth pattern. Um, you don't have all those freedoms that we talked about. The owner is central to the business. The owner is what everything is a hub and wheel around, right? And the business can only grow as large as that owner can manage. Anything more than that starts to implode. Things start to break down. And this is where owners get exhausted and tired and you know health issues pop in and everything else because you can only manage so much. And so what happens to grow is you have to work more and faster and harder and maybe cut corners, because that's the only way you can do more in this kind of a um, operations model. No, you just don't sleep, that's okay. Well, yeah, that too. <laughs> and caffeine, lots of caffeine. <laughs> and then the last, if you're doing the math, the last percentage is 5% that thrive. Those is the percentage of businesses that actually get to that ideal that we were talking about. Four to five percent is all that ever gets there, right? So what's the difference, right? So most of the time, the biggest difference is that the owner of the companies that are not thriving, the ones that are surviving, the ones that are just surviving, are running their business, or actually the business runs them, but they're not building a business. They're not managing the big picture of the business. They're just in the operations. Does that make sense? So the first thing, there's two steps to getting to the other side of the, of the goal, and that's knowledge. You gotta know, that's job number one. You gotta learn what you need to know to build a business that grows, and that is that ideal. And the second thing you have to do is take action. You gotta do something with it. So why aren't more businesses successful? That sounds simple enough, just learn what you need to do and do it, right? But it goes back to that thing before where most business owners are really good at what their business does. That's why they start that business, around their passion, which is nothing wrong with that, but if you as an owner don't step up and become that, what I call a growth-oriented leader, that visionary for the business that's building it to grow and be prosperous, who's gonna do it? No one is, you, you can't hire that person, and big corporations might hire that as a CEO, but as a small business owner, that has to be you, so you have to step out of that role, and that's hard to do, 
especially if you're passionate and you're comfortable in doing what you do and do well. This is why they're not successful. The first thing is they haven't learned what they need to know. They, you don't know what you don't know, like I said before. So there's two ways to learn. You can learn through trial and error, or you can learn from somebody else. So what do entrepreneurs do? Anybody want to guess? Trial and error. That's right. Yeah. Trial and error. Because first of all, it's in our DNA. Right? We're hard workers. We're smart. We're good at what we do. So we can figure it out. And that's absolutely true. We I think can. We know better. <laughs> What's that? I think we know better. That's right. Well, we're smarter than the average bear, usually. Right? <laughs> at least we think so. Um, and we're tenacious. And we're hard working. So usually those things pay off for you. The problem with entrepreneurship and that 85% that failure rate the first five years is that you've got one huge enemy. Time. Right? And trial and error takes a lot of time and it's really expensive because even if you're not out flowing cash and trying things, you're losing opportunities. So that's the problem with trial and error. So the next thing is, is you have to learn from someone else. But we've got this thing called information overload and it's even worse today because we got the internet, which I absolutely love because I love to learn. So you can teach yourself anything. All you need is Google in a few hours, right? You've got like a semi to my bachelor's degree and whatever you want to have, <laughs> right? But you've got billions, well, I say billions, billions, whatever, lots of books, CDs, audio programs, webinars, podcasts, vlogs, you name it, it's unlimited on how much information. And then you have to discern what's relevant, what do I need to do, where do I start, all those sorts of things. So then the next problem is this thing called failure to implement. So we learn everything, but we don't do anything different. We don't know where to start. So you've got all these binders, and I say binders, that's kind of old school. <laughs> but you have all these files or all these bookmarks videos, right, on YouTube, but we don't do anything with it because we don't know where to start. So they just collect dust. So when we develop, when I developed this, um, this Build It to Grow program, that was kind of the, the idea behind it. First, we're going to have focus, very relevant, very actionable knowledge, information that you need. And then we're going to lay it out in a step-by-step -step process. So that's what we did. And then we're going to overcome that failure to implement by adding an accountability component to it. So one, working as a group to do this, now you have your peers that are holding you accountable, saying, hey, what did you do? You see other people doing it, you're not doing it. Entrepreneurs are kind of like on their own so much, especially in their own environment or if you're a solopreneur. So you don't really have anybody that knows what you're doing, what you're supposed to do, what you told yourself you're gonna do. So you don't always get held accountable. So that's an important piece of it as well. All right, so the first thing you wanna do, there's two steps to creating a business that's ideal. And the first one is to build it so that it's saleable or sellable, that it can be sold. Now, you may never want to sell it that may not even be in your long-term vision, right? Or some people might say, well, I'm gonna give this to my children someday. You still wanna transition it. I spent 10 years working with a client in the mergers and acquisition world. And the reason I did that is because I knew how to build companies organically, but companies also grow through acquisition. So I wanted to understand that world. But I also wanted to know why, me from an entrepreneurial family, some businesses sell for millions of dollars and the owner is set for life and others close their doors and they walk away and they have nothing to show for decades of hard work. What's the difference? So, the difference is a company that is sellable, right? Now, if you don't sell your company, who owns it? You. That's right. Wouldn't you want to own a company that somebody else would want to own? So, you guys that are real estate agents, like, yeah. you know, the houses that are beautiful and sell like immediately and they have offers that are outbidding themselves, those are the homes versus the ones that have to come in and be rehabbed and all of that sort of stuff. Same thing with a business. The things that make it sellable are the things that make it valuable. It's the things that make it profitable. So if you're going to own it, then why not make it have all of those things that um, someone else would want in it? So to do that, the very first thing you have to do is become kind of have an investor mindset because that's who buys businesses are investors most of the time. So you have to think with the end in mind. So it's kind of like a marathon. You look at this little graphic that's up here because it's not a sprint. You can't do it overnight. It's kind of like getting in shape after you've been sitting on a couch for five years, right? Like, did anybody ever have that app, Couch to 5K? Yes. Yes. 
I've had it deleted at least three times. <laughs> right? They don't have you go out the first day and run five, three miles, 3.2 miles, whatever it is. Because you would die and you would puke and you would never go out and run again, right? <laughs> so they go out and you go, if anybody, if you haven't ever done it before, they have you run like a block and then you walk a block and then you run a block and you feel really good about yourself, right? But it's a transition and by the end of, I think it's 30 days or something like that, then you're running your 5K. And then you can probably up it to your 10K and then you're running a half marathon and all of a sudden, same thing with building up your business. You've got to start wherever you are, whether you're on the couch, you've been walking and now you're going to start running and you work your way up. So, building um, your company so that it's an investment, thinking like an investor, also making it profitable is the next thing you have to do. You have to have positive net income at the end of the day. It's not about revenues, it's not about sales, it's not about salary. How much are you making? How much are you bringing home? It's really starting to become financially oriented. How much is coming in? What are your costs? What's left over? And there has to be enough left over to actually grow the business. It can't be break even, it can't be just below. And you can't be constantly um, putting money into it to keep it afloat. And then building it, we talked about this a little bit, building it to grow versus just having a, I, I run a company mentality. All right. So an ideal business that is saleable is scalable, which means it can easily grow and it can do it um, quickly no matter how, how much you grow. So whether you're selling two units or 200 units, if you implode at 200, you're not scalable. You don't have the systems and processes in place to grow that fast. So that's the biggest pushback that I probably get is like my mindset is, is that most companies aren't ready to grow. They need to get their foundation in place so that they can turn on that growth faucet and boom, go. The sky's the limit. So do your, fat, your homework first and get there and then you'll grow exponentially. The next one is having a predictable profit so you can see it coming, you know the trends. And then autonomous basically means that a business can run, A, most importantly, without you, the owner, being there day to day to make sure everything happens the way it should be. But even more important than that is that it's not dependent upon any one person. So let's say you start a business and you bring your daughter in and she graduates from college and all of a sudden you can go out, finally, can go on vacation for 10 days to Europe, which you've been dreaming about doing for two decades, and she can run it for you and you feel pretty good. But now, what happens if something happens to her, the business implodes. So you have to have it so that that person can maybe not be replaced overnight, but can easily be replaced. So the second one, we said build it to be saleable. The second one is build it to grow. That's where the franchise model comes in. So I told a couple of you we were chatting beforehand that we would talk a little bit about franchising. So franchising, I want to just stop real quick because that's not a type of business, it's a operational model. But most people think franchise, they think McDonald's or Subway, right? But it is an operational model, and that's what you wanna have in place. It's a method of how you run your business, how things are done, it's functional, and it's a documentation of workflows and tasks. Down to the very last detail. Do you know where most entrepreneurial companies documented workflows and tasks are? That's right, right inside the brain of the owner. And <laughs> it's a scary place. <laughs> it can be, and the problem is, is that that's one of the reasons why the owner becomes such a can't step away is because they basically become a centralized computer system for the business. So if I, as a new employee, need to know something, I don't have anywhere to go to get that information except for from you. I have to get it from your brain. And like anything else, you don't learn and remember something perfectly the first time, so you have to go back over and over again. So you become that hub, and everything becomes dependent upon you. And then, basically on this franchise model, the concept of any business can be franchised. And I would say every business should shoot for this, whether you're a one-man band, or you are a 10-man shop that's trying to expand and open a second location. Because if nothing else, your quality, profitability, everything else will improve because you're doing everything consistently. Um, but also your stress level goes down because you don't have to reply, rely upon your own brain for re recalling what you need to do, when and what time and what order, because you can use tasks, you can use checklists, you can get into your brain. You love a checklist, right? 
Right, right. So once you get it out of your brain, that's the hard part because you aren't trained on how to do that. But once you get it out of your brain into a checklist, then you go and work from the checklist. Even though it came from your own brain, you go to the checklist. Then you don't have to spend precious energy trying to remember what am I supposed to do? Did I do it? Did I not? Because you've got your list. Does that make sense? If I have any questions? Yes. Yeah. That also just frees your mind from tedious stuff so that it allows you to expand your thinking into other things that, like ideas, things that might actually right. So work. In, it's your brain are to be better. That's all the operational stuff that's running it. So let's say you're kind of stuck between one one goal and the other, right? You're trying to become that growth-oriented leader that's, that's building a business versus running it. But you're still doing a lot of the running. Now, like you said, you free your mind up from all of that. What did I do? Did I get it done? Did I follow up with this person? Because you've got it all documented and tracked, and now I can spend, I have more bandwidth to spend on that other stuff. So it makes you more uh, productive, for sure. All right, so why franchise? We probably touched on some of these already, but you, you'll increase the value of your business. You can grow or scale so much easier. Your labor costs go down, right? Because you don't have to redo things a lot of times. You're doing it right the first time and your training costs go down. Um, also reduces your dependency upon just one person, especially yourself. Uh, and then it reduces risk. So we talked about that 80% failure rate versus an 80% success rate for the franchise um, and then it's easier to hire train replace um, and develop your team because it's all all, all, uh, all documented and all systematized I'll grab a drink real quick you'll also find that like I just did that where I wrote down everything that I do. Um, I have it open on my computer at all times because I'm constantly realizing there's more things that I do. Um, and we call it a few homework because I'm realizing I say, oh, I don't have time to do that, I don't have time to do that. And if I start looking at all the things that I do and where I spend my time, I'm like, oh, well, that just opened up three hours in my week because I thought I was spending time here, but I wasn't. So you're uh, identifying things you can eliminate. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Because yeah. they're not as they're not focused or on where, where their goals are. Or what are. I was doing, and then I say I just need a system to do that, and then all of a sudden that system is created and it knocks off a million to do. Yeah, and I'm kind of digging yeah. into that concept, but when you develop the system over time, you're constantly improving it, and that improvement makes it more time efficient. So you yeah. save yourself time over over yeah. that too. I have one system that I've been doing forever and ever and ever, and all of a sudden I just one day just kind of step back. I'm like, I don't need to even do ten of these steps anymore. At one point I needed to do ten of those steps, but something changed with the technology, and I realized I just go to step eleven, and I was like, you know, but all right, and it's easier and fa uh, faster to sell. So again, going back to mergers and acquisitions, those investors they do not want companies that are dependent upon one person running it because they, unless they're buying a job, they don't want to come in and take over. And even if they do, how much of that success of the business is dependent upon you and the way you do things and how do they do that? How are they going to replicate that without getting it out of your brain? And if you haven't been able to put it on paper, they aren't going to be able to put it on paper. So all those sorts of things. This one up a little bit above about um, reducing the dependence upon one person, including the owner. Um, it also reduces your costs uh, and what we call um, like the hostage syndrome. So I was just talking with a nonprofit the other day and they had someone come in, superstar. She came in, she went out, tapped her social network and got and wrote, wrote, uh, raised like $300,000 for this network, uh, this nonprofit. So they were thrilled with her, but then somebody put a little bug in her head that told her that she was worth way more than what they were paying her. So she basically demanded much more, which they just could not afford. So they did up, because they loved her, they upped um, what they were offering her, but she she said no, and she walked away. Disgruntled, not just like, I understand, but that's not gonna work for me, disgruntled. Now they're worried that all of these other um, and donators will go away because she's not happy with them. So they got themselves in a situation now where how are we going to du duplicate that revenue next year because she's walked away and we couldn't afford her at this new level. So again, if they had developed a system for generating revenues, they could just plug and play, so to speak, another person under that role. All right, so the next thing you have to do, really, to build a business to grow is to get focused. 
focus is really so super important because so many businesses try to do too many things, all right? Um, so what we did was we kind of came up with this build it to grow, that's what BI2G stands for, by a little acronym, um, for a niche builder triad. So that's really made up of three things. One, it's what I call your unique customer focus, and that is really what you do really, really well, how you do it, and who it's perfect for. And that takes some strategy and some reflection, but that is really looking at what you do well, and who loves it, and then going after them and identifying who they are. The next one then, and that unique customer focus feeds into your unique sales message, your compelling sales message. So then how do you articulate what you do to the right people? And say it in such a way that they want to do business with you instead of your competitors, and they want to pay, pay you a fair price, not just shop on cheapest, right? So that's a big, huge frustration for business owners is that they just feel beat up on price all the time. They feel like they have to drop their price constantly just to compete. But the, what the missing link is, is A, talking to the people that want exactly what you do and then telling them something that's compelling. Because if you guys think about it, there's a lot of things we shop on price because we view it as a commodity. And then there's other things that we'll pay whatever they're asking for because we want it. So think about that. And then the last one is your strategic detraction piece. Now that isn't just going out there and getting a bunch of new business and a bunch of new leads. That's really playing it super smart and outsmarting the marketplace, and using those other two variables, the unique customer focus and your, your sales message, say it where it needs to be said, in the right way, at the right time, in the least amount of times to generate the most return or the most leads, pulling all that together. So there's one more concept, I'm gonna come back to this before we jump into this, one more concept I wanna introduce to you guys, and I'm gonna have to fly through, I don't wanna spend a lot of time on it, but it's the, business growth engine, right? Um, it's a very strategic way to drive growth in your business in a step-by-step -step process. Uh, but before I do that, I kinda wanna do a little business 101 and go through these eight business functions. When I was talking about franchises before, I didn't mention this, but in my career, I've invested in two different franchise businesses. One was a national marketing program and one was a national sub sandwich shop. So I own two different franchises. And both of them taught me a tremendous amount of, of things about systemization and what works and what doesn't in addition to mergers and acquisition, in addition to my degree in business, in addition to my years of entrepreneur experience with my family. But what I, found, what I know is that the more successful a franchise is, say McDonald's, the more of these functions that are systematized. And they demand that you do them all their way. Right? So down to one of them is finance and asset protection. So the, the cash registers and these big chain ones will take your numbers and your sales every day and go straight to their corporate offices. Now, 20 years ago, they had, you know, you hand reported it. Well, they got smart on that because not everything gets reported, right? So they're developing their systems to get what it is too. And why do they want to know the revenues and that sort of thing? Because they get a royalty off the top, off the gross, not the net. That's a whole other discussion about franchises. But not your net profits, your gross revenues. Whether you're profitable or not, it doesn't matter. They're still making money off the top. Um, so the more expensive ones, right, they systematize every single one of those and demand that you do that, or they take your franchise away from you. Like Chick-fil-A and saying, uh, what is it, have you said? Uh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. my pleasure. That's right, that's part of their system. That's part of their fulfillment system, which is working, which is basically every time you come in contact with your customer. And, it, and they scripted it down to how do you greet them, how do you, how do they, when they leave the store, what do you do, how do you treat them when they're in the store, all of that sort of thing. All right, so there are four of these functions that sustain growth. That basically means that it keeps your company afloat and let's, allows you to manage successfully the business that you have coming in. That's planning, team development, your back office operations, as well as the financial and asset management that we just talked about. The other four are really, those are the growth engine functions. Those are the four business growth engine functions. And that is attraction, conversion, fulfillment, <coughs> and then customer development. And the center of all of that is vision and leadership. That's the growth-oriented business leader. But when you're an entrepreneur that's busting your butt day in, day out just to get everything done that needs to get done, that's very little mental energy is spent there on the big picture.
so why do we call it an engine? Well, it basically functions like a motor in your car. You've got all these different components. They all have to work individually, and they all have to work together. And the better they do, the better the engine runs. Right? And your business is the same way. You've got all these functions and these components, and most, as I said before, most business owners are really, really good at what they do. So which vision or which function is that? Fulfillment. It's one of eight. That's the one they're good at. They, they open up their business, right? So you got to make them all work together in order to move forward. So we're going to start with fuel in this growth engine analogy that I'm going to outline for you guys. So we talked about focus before. It's the same little diagram up there. You've got your compelling message, your unique customer focus, and your strategic attraction tactics. So you mix your own fuel for a company because every single company is unique. If you really look at your unique customer focus, even if you have two companies that do the exact same thing, they do it a little differently. And they can appeal to different niches or segments of the market. So once you have that figured out, it then feeds into your attraction the customers that you're going to attract and bring in the door. That then leads to conversion. How are you going to close them so that they become paying customers? Which then, there's two pieces to that. Nurturing and your sales process. Because you guys all know that just because you get a lead doesn't mean you have a customer. Right? So there's two pieces to that. A lot of times, salespeople, and I'll put entrepreneurs in the sales role because at one point you take that hat off, right? And you put on the sales hat and you put on the phone hat and you put on the next hat, you either, a lot of times the salesperson will go after a lead, if they're not ready to buy right now, then they ignore them because they gotta move on to something else and they never come back to them. Well, if you've got a conversion process really working well, you've got a nurturing process that develops them over time and communicates to them that compelling message. Why is it that they wanna do business with you when they're ready to do business? Because not they're not all ready right now. They will be in the future potentially, and you wanna be there. And then when they're ready, that's when you get the second part, the sales process. That's when you walk them through your sales process, actually close them, and then that leads on to now it's time to fulfill. But you can see how that's a closed loop conversion because you get the lead, you nurture them, you try your sales process, maybe they don't close, you go back to the nurture. You keep cycling through until they lead up to fulfill. You never abandon them. You don't want to because you're leaving a valuable asset or resource laying on the table. Or worse, you're letting a competitor pick them up later down the road and get that, that deal for you. How and then, yeah. Sorry, how many touches do you usually find that it takes before you close somebody? You know, the, the industry average is like 7 to 10 right. or something like that, but every industry is going to be different. It's really going to be, the more complex the sale is and the higher risk it is, the more touches you're going to sure. have to have, you know. You don't have to touch somebody seven to ten times to buy a widget. No. You know, at Target, you're walking through and you see something, oh, that's cute, it's in the basket and, and it's at home, right? Um, but something like a home, you'll probably go, I don't know, you guys are real estate agents, how many times, I mean, when you've got a buyer, how many homes on average do they look at? Before they decide. The industry average is around 13, but now it's more just because inventory is so low and it's so competitive. You really, and trying to find that right house for that buyer, it is more challenging. So. And that's that's the other end of the spectrum of your investment. Usually, most oftentimes, the biggest investment you'll make. So, lots of lots of options that they're looking for. Yes. This is something that we struggle with. You know, and I call we'll call them company call businesses, and it's like I have lists and my lists of you know, the contact person, and it's just like I don't have time to like. Do this myself. Try marketing. You know, what do you find to be really effective? As far as like, you send them a letter, you send them a follow-up call, an email. I mean, it's just it's hard to stay in front of them, and you don't want them to just be on a generic like, email list. You know, like from an insurance perspective, it's, mm -hmm. not, it's different. Like a real estate agent, I think like other industries that works for that, but for us, I feel like getting that generic email. I don't know. It's well, I'll address that. It, the, okay. the, the one thing that I've always said about the generic email versus no generic email is that even if it gets deleted, like in a nanosecond, you got a, you got an impression that just goes in your brain. So you got that, if nothing else, right? Now I have a lot of uh, rules that filter my emails right from my inbox into. I've got one that's called newsletters. <laughs> it goes straight to that, but I still go through that because it's part of my system. Not every my rules fail me sometimes. And so I gotta make sure something didn't go in there that I need and then I move it to another box. So I go through and I click, but I see it and I know what's there. And I also go back to those and I'll search when I want something. So let's say I'm going to Dick's to buy a football or whatever. 
So I'll go in there, I'm like, do I have any dicks coupons? And I give my husband and boys and they go up there and do their damage. And so, but I look for that first. So I do use it, but I'm not opening every single one. So dicks could look at that, my open rate, and go, oh, we're gonna unsubscribe her because she's not, but I don't wanna be unsubscribed because one day I'm gonna wanna go through and see what sales they got that day. Does that make sense? And then to your point, this is the challenge when you're yourself is that there is a lot to do to build it up. So that's why it's a marathon, it takes a lot of time. So you can't have it perfect to begin with. So let's say your MO right now is I talk to them, they had to close, I go, I, I just go away because I don't, I'm going on to the next lead. But now I say, okay, you know what, I'm just gonna follow up with these guys once every six months and that's what you begin with. That is an improvement over and above, never touching them again. And then as your bandwidth and your resources improve or you've got new technology and tools, maybe you can touch them every three months with something different. Does that help? And then when you have a larger corporation and they have a sales team, it's really their role to develop the system for the salesperson to use it's a tool to make you, and you know, I'm yeah, like assuming I you're in a sales role, then the, you're yeah, more effective. Yeah, small agencies, but it's like, you know, I compete with people that are using like Salesforce as a pretty popular mm -hmm. database that other like so, yeah. agencies use, but like we can't afford a system like that at our agency. So, so you use like yeah. something on a free level? Like HubSpot has a and that kind of reminds you and schedule it for you, so you don't even have to think about it anymore. Or there's like a local company called Best Noise here, which is like 10 bucks per user, and they'll create it however you want it to be created. So if there's still free options, and that'll take a little bit off your plate to having to remember up here. Yeah, there are a lot of options, like Salesforce.com is cream, the cream tool, so everybody knows of it because. A, it advertises a lot, and people are talking about it because it's expensive, so there's pros and cons. But there's lots of tools, and that's one of the things that we do in our Build It to Grow program, is as a group of entrepreneurs, brainstorming, like you just said, you know, like this tool worked for me, or this tool did that, or here's what we recommend as a program developer that uses as a starting level. For example, uh, Office 365, a year ago, released a CRM tool that's kind of the back door, and I haven't heard anybody else talking about it, but I'm, CRM is like, I, in my blood, I started doing CRM right out of college before it was really CRM. Before, before it was like emails and reminders and alerts, we printed reminders that went to the printer and then the sales guy called. So, and it was like, the little files I Right, and oh, yeah. yeah, it was like, you write down when you call them. I used to brag, I'm like, it was DOS based, now I'm like, I should stop saying that. <laughs> it used to make me feel like really, Experience now. I'm like people don't even know what DOS is. Stop <laughs> talking about that. <laughs> we were in a meeting one time. There was a younger guy there. And we go, do you know what a dot matrix printer is? And he's like, hmm. And we just start laughing, <laughs> teasing him. You know what an LP is? Um, okay. So here, when you fulfill, so <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? Are you speaking another language? <laughs> Printer? My point exactly. <laughs> printer, very right, right. What, why do you print things? What do you need paper for? <laughs> All right, so fulfillment. So the other piece of fulfillment, fulfillment gives you a little bit of profit if you do it right, if it's priced properly. So that, there's two pieces to fulfillment. It's delivering what you said you're gonna deliver, when you said you're gonna deliver it, how you said you're gonna deliver it, and at the price you said you deliver at. Those all seem like no-brainers, but I can tell you guys stories and stories and stories because I'm hyper aware of this, of companies that screw all three of those things up. And then you, want to do then you do it so they walk away with a wow experience so that they A, come back, and B, tell other people, hey, and recommend them. Versus the polar opposite, which I like to say is they come in the front door smiling and they run out the back door screaming, going, ah, and then they tell everybody that they know, don't ever go back there again. I call it anti-advertising. <laughs> That's the last thing you want to do. So you really have to look at your fulfillment and make sure you're doing that well so they have a wow experience and that you're doing it profitably and you're looking at every expense that's involved in delivering that product and service and making sure that you're pricing it so you have a little bit left over. So many entrepreneurs don't do that. They look at what the market is or they cave to pricing pressure and they drop their price and they end up losing money on every single transaction and that you're never gonna, A, grow, but you're not gonna stay open either when that happens. And then the last piece, that fourth uh, function that we talked about is developing. That's developing the customer. So if you've got that wow experience, then they're gonna come back. 
right? And then hopefully, if you're smart, you're not focusing so much on getting more new customers, you're focusing on selling to them again and again and again or different products and different services. And why would you want to do that? Because you get a bigger pie bowl, which is profit, read profit, with a repeat sale. And the reason you get a bigger pot of gold is because when you get that first sale underneath the wow, it's the cost for attracting and converting that sale gets carved out of the money, out of the profit, hopefully, that's there in your pricing. But when you sell them again, you didn't have to, you might have to convert them a little bit because you had to resell them, but you don't have to attract them again. So you get a lot more profit out of that and over and over and over again. And especially if you got them on some, some sort of a perpetual product. You know, where you got membership based and all the software that go into that, so you guys know what I'm talking about. And then the other piece of the development is the referrals. So proactively generating referrals from your customers. And that's so powerful for a couple of reasons. One, because if they are perfect for you, we talked about that for your unique customer focus, then they're gonna refer people that are a lot like them, which means they're gonna be ideal for you as well. So they're going to be easier to close. They're going to be happier with what you do. They're going to have more of a wow experience. They're also going to be more likely to close and convert. You recommended them. They're, they were recommended to you. So they have that confidence level. And referrals almost always are at the far right end of the sales process. They're ready to buy now. That's why they're asking for referrals. Hey, when you go, I need an attorney because I need to set up an LLC. They're not like, I'm thinking about opening a business. Do I want to do a limited partnership? Do I want to do a corporation? Do I want to do an LLC? Am I going to be a sole proprietor? What am I going to make? They're not even, they're ready. Yep. So they're going, to, they're going to close now. So that happens much faster as well. That's the growth engine. So here's the thing. There is a very specific order in doing things. This is the traditional order as far as how things happen chronologically. You attract, you convert, you deliver, and then hopefully, if you're smart, the business is structured well, it's developing and getting repeat business. But if you want to optimize your business to grow really, really well and work on how to make it more profitable, then you want to start with your dashboard, which is your metrics. You want to look at, A, first of all, we talked about fulfillment. Is it profitable? Look at your numbers. What are your costs? What are your expenses? What are you charging? And just do the math and make sure you've got enough money left over to reinvest in the business or pay the owner, not you for delivering the work, but you as an owner, as an investor, because investments should be producing income for you. Then um, you analyze all of that customer feedback. That's all in your dashboard. The next thing you want to do is look at your fulfillment. You have to make sure your fulfillment is rock solid and awesome. And I tell entrepreneurs all the time, if you get that part right, the business a lot of times for a small company will grow to the point where they don't have to do anything else because you've got the people coming back and they're sending people to you. And if I had time today, I brought a bunch of balloons. So I was going to do this exercise, but I don't. So I'm just going to explain it to you. Aww. I'm sorry. <laughs> so it's this balloon concept. And when I owned my um, sub sandwich shop franchise, I tried to explain this to my, my employees. So if people come in the front door, this is where I, where I got the analogy of running out the back door and screaming. I'm like, you don't want that. You want them to come in, love the place, tell their friends. They come back the next day for a sandwich. They bring their friend with them the next day. The next day, if you envision a balloon and you're blowing and blowing and blowing into that balloon, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, right? But if you've got a hole in your balloon and you're blowing just as hard as the guy next to you and puffing and puffing, your balloon's not going to inflate. It's going to stay the same. But you're still working just as hard as the person next to you who's blowing into that balloon, right? And theirs is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So if you've got any kind of hole in your fulfillment, right, where, you know, instead of saying my pleasure, it's like, yeah, whatever. And people are like, well, they're really rude. I'm going to go to the other chicken shop to get my stuff, right? That kind of stuff may not seem like a big deal to the owner who's running around with their hair on fire and trying to put out, you know, a bunch of fires and issues and HR and unemployment and all this other kind of stuff, but it does affect that balloon growing and growing and growing. So it's super important. So you gotta get that one right. Then focus on the development. Come, have them come back, get better, uh, more sales, bigger share of their wallet, they call it. And then convert. Now, convert comes after these two because if we're gonna convert more leads, we wanna be able to handle that fulfillment. Remember we talked about scalability, right? And being able to handle two or 200 of whatever it happens. So we don't want to convert more leads and then not have the infrastructure in place to be able to really handle that well. And then 
be able to develop them. So you're going, for every new one prospect you convert, you're going to become more profitable for it if you got those other two things coming well. And then the last one you focus on is attraction, because now it's all just going down the pipe. Does that make sense? But this is where most businesses start. They start with attraction. They're like, I need more business, I want to grow, so I'm going to go generate more leads but they may have a huge hole in fulfillment or their conversion process may not be any good. So I might be generating 200 leads and only closing three of them because, well, let's say 100 for easy math. You know, they say like four or 5% of your whole um, prospect base is ready to buy right now. So if I generate 100 leads and I can only close three of them, four, let's be honest, that means 96 of them just fizzled out because I never did anything with them. So I go generate 100 more and 100 more and 100 more versus setting up a system to take those 96 and nurture them and coax them and make them happy so that when they get ready to, I can convert more of those. So now maybe I'm converting 20% over time. That's huge. And I didn't spend any more money generating leads. Or over time, I'm just growing exponentially. That's how that works. That's how that concept works. So your job is to systematize and optimize those eight functions and in this order, feedback, fulfillment, Customer development, conversion, and then attraction. Now, it doesn't mean, you know, don't go generate any more leads. Or if somebody calls you, go, oh, I'm sorry, I'm working on fulfillment right now, and I don't have any bandwidth for a conversion. You'll have to call me back next month, hopefully, I'm ready to. But, go. You understand, you know, if you're going to put some energy on something, do it in those orders. Now, you may analyze it and say, our conversion's rock solid, we're awesome. Okay, then we go down the next step and go to customer development. We'll work on that. But this is the order you go. And everybody's growth strategy is a little different based upon where you are and where you want to go. But you move through it that, in that order in order to optimize. All right, one function at a time. So that builds it to the Build It to Grow program. So basically, to do that, you've got two options. You can stay the current course. You can just do what you're doing. And if nothing's broken, then that's awesome because you don't want to fix what's not broken. So you just stay your current course. Or you learn to do something different, right? So you've got trial and error. We talked about that before. Or you can learn from someone else. So that's what our, our Build It to Grow program is all about. <laughs> so I, and I'll give you guys a little bit of some information about the program if you're interested. Or any of you that, um, with the 11 minutes we have left, but I want to give you some a chance to ask some questions first before I do that. But I will tell you, if you're interested in learning more, and I, if I do run out of time, if you text LBB earlier and you're in the system, just text more, the word more, and then I can just send you some information on it so you can get some of that. Um, but you have to do the LBB first so that I have your email address. Um, but I will do that because we're going to launch a program this fall or late summer, and um, I'm going to do some special offers, like kind of early bird stuff, just to people that express interest in the program instead of our whole database. So if you do have some interest, let me know on that. But any questions before I kind of go over the, how our program set up? Yeah. So I completely agree and get what you're saying that the operational model of a franchise is that, like to documented workflow and tasks. At, at what point though do you not tell somebody everything? And, and the reason why I'm asking, my older brother has a very successful company. Mm -hmm. Extremely. About 10 years ago, he let, uh, because he trusted you know, his workforce. He gave all of the documented workflow and tasks to three people okay. who ended up taking and going and opening up their own company. And competing against him? Yeah. Did he have uh, not yeah. Not yeah. Not yeah. Absolutely. Place? Okay, did he go after him? Absolutely. Oh, and did he win? Ish. Ish, yeah. Ish. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so my husband, I am so impressed with his business model. But then I think, and I love the idea of writing down because he does he he doesn't want to be in the office all day every day. He wants to be on his boat. Yeah, he should. But be. my <laughs> fear with that, you cannot give everyone or can't give even one person all of your secrets. Mm -hmm. I guess what I'm thinking and well, so I'll talk to that just a little bit though because I understand completely what you're talking about. Uh, McDonald's gives away all their secrets in an operations manual. It just costs you about $50,000 just for the franchise license, and then it costs you about a million bucks to build out the restaurant itself. Um, that operations manual for my, I own a Jimmy John's, so 
that operations manual is required. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> knew it had to be Jimmy Thomas. They're good. It was required to be in a safe at all times. Oh. Okay. Now, we had access to it. We weren't allowed to make, now it's all legal. You know, it's legal. You're not allowed to make a copy. It had to be in a safe. Only the managers could get to the safe. Our safe had two spots. I mean, it had money for the change for the register, and then it had an upper part where we kept our dip certificates and the manual. And only the shift, the manager and the assistant manager had the key to the upper part. But they still had access to it. Um, and if you're really um, evil, I'll just say evil, you know, if somebody who's mischievous, you know, could take it and the, the owner's not there and go make photocopies of whatever. I mean, you can't get away from thievery, um, but that's what your legal system's for. But if you don't, you protect yourself first and foremost with your legalities and your non competes and your confidentialities, um, and then you have to go after them. Um, that's all I can, that's all so then, I think. So then your answer is then yes, you do have to give out all the information. Now you may find in, in a super large company you've got marketing and sales processes and you're giving that to your marketing manager. And they don't understand all of your back office tricks and, and techniques and your ordering and inventory and all that kind of stuff. You know, the small so divide company and is huh? divide and conquer. Potentially, yeah. And, until you're at a point where you're selling the franchise license and somebody has to be able to clone you completely and they have to know all your secrets, then you probably don't have to worry about that, especially if you've got multiple roles within your company. But if you're small enough where somebody's like wearing all the hats, like an entrepreneur usually is, then you're gonna have to share all that with them. And the only recourse and protection you have is, the, is your, legal, your legal protection. That's all I can say on that. And that's unfortunate that your brother got taken. Um, but, you know, and then again, that's probably a good question for an attorney to really say, how can I protect myself the most? Well, and I would say that you could set the tone with anybody you hire in a position like that right and on right in advance to say, hey, I want you to know I trust you with this information. And if you so choose, you know, to violate your non-compete, I will come out. I will you. take you but down. I will destroy you. <laughs> just so you know. So the yeah. <laughs> thing is, somebody knew that up front and they were intending on doing something like that, it would scare them away. They'd go find somebody without the legal protection. Well, what, what's 50000 compared to a million dollars, though? And that's not very scary. You know, you see, I, I'm just picking yeah, up. Yeah, you just think I'm, that, well, and I remember a story of these guys in California. Jimmy John's did not have franchises in California. If you're familiar with the franchise model at all, you, you get licensed per state. So that's why you don't, you know, they're all in the Midwest and then are the East Coast and they don't have them out west. And there were all of a sudden some Jimmy John or some sub sandwiches popped up out in the California that had very similar names and all the ingredients on the sandwiches were identical and all this kind of stuff. They went after them and they ended up being, when they did their due diligence, they ended up being prior ship uh, managers, store general managers for other Jimmy John's that were from and then they went out west and they opened up their own place but they didn't pay Jimmy John's and they were kind of doing. Now did they, pro did they have a copy of the manual? Probably not but they you know, you work it for five years, you kind of learn it, right? And then maybe you were, maybe you were smart enough, you were writing it down, I don't know. But they went after them. And then probably could either A, put them out of business, first of all, sue them, but put them out of business. And then secondly, um, at least change their operations so no longer can they have, you know, instead of a turkey tom, have a tom turkey or whatever. <laughs> Whenever they tweak it a little bit to act like they're not talking about them. I would say also, um, as much as we want to say, I'm going to learn from the mistakes of others, we cannot let that fear absolutely hold us back. The thing, and I know, know your, your brother's situation, and I'm sure he had some aspects, but finding out what the people that you are entrusting with that information, what they value and what makes them feel valued, and creating a company culture around that, yeah. that they're always worth it. It's a little bit like tweaking, not golden rule, but the platinum rule. Don't, you know, golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Like, I really want, you know, Visa credit cards as my bonus, whereas this person doesn't so much. She'd rather have a uh, cruise vacation or something and we hit goals. So creating that culture, you're not going to be able to always um, eliminate somebody from taking it, but it, you have to yeah. have faith in your employees and trust and build that culture for the ones that you are going to entrust with that information. And, 
and I, the only other thing I would add to that is that that would be part of your strategy development is how do we do this and protect ourselves? Because it's not there's not black and white answers for any of this. That's why what strategy is. Strategy is really think tanking, right? So it's a legitimate concern. And then sitting down and you bring in attorneys and lawyers that have expertise in, in intellectual property protection and saying how do we do this? Because we want to grow and expand. We want to free up. But we want, but we've seen it. Someone been burned, and we don't, or you know, or I've been burned, and I don't want that to happen. How do we do it the best we can? And I always tell our clients too. And again, when you're getting burned in a situation like this, you don't want to have a lot of trial and error, right? Um, but on a lot of systems and processes, when something doesn't go right, then you just kind of step back and say, Hey, if I had to do this again, how would I have done it differently? And that becomes the beginnings of your next level of your system or your first system. And then you try it, and you're going to find some glitches and some holes and some trip ups and then you, you fix those. Because a, one, a system's never finished. It's always improved and polished. Does that help? It, uh, it, yes. Okay. It, it, and and honestly, what I'm, the main takeaway, I think I'm, because my older brother has recouped and is just as successful as before, I just need to ask him his trial and error. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. 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 I'm sure he's yeah. doing something different than he did before. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure he is. Probably put more fear of God in these guys too. Because I would guess they probably walked away and didn't think anything would happen. Probably when they did it. And maybe they were just I mean, there's all kinds of reasons yeah, people do things reasons. that they do. But anybody else have any questions, thoughts, ideas? The thought that comes to my mind is so you talk about fulfillment and that wow factor, mm -hmm. which for me is all, and I think probably anybody in this room is always the goal. But what I have really is just. That your timing being here is perfect because I realize much more clearly of late I have big goals, but in order to scale, I have there's a lot of things I have to do differently, including can't be the only person. I think there's probably a lot of people in the room that feel the same way. Yeah, can't be the yeah, and cannot be the only person doing everything, and so it's just so. And I love the fact that you have a very clear system in place to create you know whatever it is we want. So, yeah. yeah, and I'll tell you, so the program is 15 months long. Every month we go through a different modular concept to work through. And some of the cons some of the modules are three different months, like yeah. three sessions to get through fulfillment, right? Because yeah. there's flawless fulfillment, there's, you know, there's compelling message, and there, anyway. But, um, so the first six modules, and this is where I kind of laugh because the sexy and exciting stuff is how do I drive the growth, right? For the first six months, the first six modules are all about the sustaining growth. It's all the foundational stuff. That, the system. Well, it's all, yeah. So systems is one of the modules. How do I develop the system? And, and it's not just education. It's tools. We give you resources, tools, uh, work packets, exercises on how do you apply this to your business, right? So you can actually apply it and practice it. Um, reading lists and... Um, uh, supplemental articles and books and everything else on the concept. And we dive deep. And then you've got, you know... For our local clients, we have workshops where we just come in and work on it for three hours. So you can get out of the office and away from all the attractions. So you've got like-minded peers that are all working with you on it and brainstorm and all that sort of stuff. And then the last seven modules are all about driving growth. So that's what everybody wants. They want to, let's drive growth. Let's get more business in the door. But unless you've got the foundational stuff in place, you, you might be imploding. So that's why we set it up that way. It's not, it's not the most popular way, but I believe in it. So that's the way it's at. So I want to just add a layer to what you just said. Yeah. So a couple years ago, there was a friend. He is a, a dynamo entrepreneur. He has uh, an organization called the Red Network, uh, and then Selfie with Soldier, and now um, Operation Civilian Support. But he's amazing. We sat down. This is really about two years ago. It might have been longer. And I think, well, what are your goals, AJ? I told him, like, big, blocky goals. I want to sell this much, blah, blah, blah. What if, what if you spent some time really developing your systems and models first? And I was like, that's a great idea, Gary. And I did a little bit of that, but I didn't do enough of it. So that was two or three years ago. Don't, don't wait that long. I could have been, if I would have listened to Gary, and if I would have had a Danette in my pocket or something <laughs> to help me do that, so I would be a much, my business would be much bigger. So it's kind of that if anything, not failure. If like any better, yeah. Yeah, and it's that kind of that failure to implement. You implement a little bit, but then it kind of fizzled out. I got busy. I got busy doing. I got busy, you know. Right. And did you have um, Gary there constantly on no, your shoulder, going, "Come no, no, on, no, come no. on, where's the system? That's the system. Give me the system." No, I was up there with real terrain. <laughs> right. Fulfilling. We do. Fulfilling. We realtor, right? We're the realtor. Okay. <laughs> I s I love this. Uh, workshop group format, especially for you know smaller companies, because 
part of my experience over the years of coming in and helping companies develop and do this for them, if you do it for them, they don't really learn it the way they need to learn it. So as soon as you're out of the picture, like Gary was gone, nobody's really doing it anymore because it didn't get ingrained. And the other thing I find is that when you do it yourself, you have a much bigger uh, appreciation for what you've developed and how well it works. And you're more likely to use it and make sure that your team is using it because you're invested. You've not only invested the money into developing it, but also the time and the energy. And it's much better than me trying to pull it out of you and then putting it down. When you're doing it with me just guiding you, it's much, much better quality. That makes sense. So all 15 of the sessions that I talked about before have presentations just like this one, which I used to give live. But we talk all about leverage, right? So I have been working for the last two years to put them all on video and make them up on the cloud. So I don't have to always be on my game. But bigger than that was my entrepreneurs, they would come and we would do a three hour workshop just like this. We'd go through it, we'd apply some stuff, they go back to their, to their field of interest. And then they get like, we can't find the time to get to do to what we want to do. So now you can watch the videos whenever you have time available. Like I'm a night person, I told you guys that earlier, my dad scarred me, right? So I do a lot of stuff at 11, 12, 1 o'clock at night. You can watch a video then, you can do it on a Sunday afternoon. And then come to the workshop to get stuff done. So that's why everything's online now as far as the, the packets that, that you can download and access. And it also makes this um, tool and resource available outside of just the St. Louis marketplace or you know, in other metropolitan areas that we set up similar. Um, so there's a mom, let's see. Create your own growth engine, drive growth, organize and manage for growth, we talked about that. And then I, I verbally told you guys all this too. We give tools, uh, the videos, the exercises, the lessons. The, uh, we do also a, a monthly call. So there's a meeting and then there's a call, kind of a accountability call, we brainstorm and that sort of stuff. And then there's a <coughs> private virtual forum on Facebook where you can post questions and brainstorm at real time with that as well. So if, when you get into the onto the webpage, you'll see this, but there's three tiers of membership. It's a membership, so it's a monthly membership. There's no obligation. You don't have to do all 15 months, okay. but if you want to get to session 15, it's progressive. Um, but you can start, and as long as it's a value, there's no contracts or anything, you just keep joining. There's the intro level, and it's a kind of a virtual, okay. and that's ideal for somebody who's in Springfield, Missouri, or Kansas City, Missouri. And I mean, I've had clients come in from Bloomington, Illinois every month. I've got one of my four-year clients comes in from Union every month. Um, but then the second level one is the workshop. So then we meet on a monthly basis, and, um, so, and then we work. We kind of get together quarterly as a group of peers socially and do something fun. So there's a little bit more to that. And then the third level is you do the program, and then I work one on one with you as well. So the program's 15 months, and then when they finish that, we opened up what's called the mastery program. So um, I've got clients that I've been working with for four years. So then after that, we just continue to work on a monthly basis. We just keep showing up, go through different modules over and over again. Because what is the, um, the key to learning? Repetition, right? So it's not one and done. And they just keep applying. I just love them. They're so passionate. So um, I've got a couple of them that have been working with me for four years. One of them is an accounting firm. Um, and she has really developed systems. One of her biggest struggles was HR. She's just been continuing to do that. She struggled with profitability. Now she's profitable, so um, I love her, I love her. And since she has always told me that she'd be more than happy to talk to people, so I'd be happy to um, pass her along if, if you're interested. All right, so again, I told you guys this earlier, just text me more and I'll send you some information. I'll just email it to you so you can go in. And then that is the systemprofitgrowth.com, bitg-info is the web page for the whole program. I'll give you all the information possibly want if you want it. Anything else? So yes, we, if we already text the LBB. Mm -hmm. Now all you have to do is text more. Okay, so we don't have to text LBB again. Nope, just okay. one time. Okay. That gets you into the system. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You did that already? I did. Okay, so yeah, so if, once you've done that, then if you text more, then I'll be able to know that you want me to send you though. Right. And then, <laughs> thank you. Thank you guys. Thanks for yeah, having thank me. Thank you. Thank you.